So who am I? Uh, like you said, my name is Mackenday Adiagbo. Um, I'm a software engineer at Facebook. That's our generic engineering title uh, for everybody. I've been there about two and a half years. In that time, I've worked on just about everything at Facebook, uh, from photos, notes, groups, events, uh, even some work on the blog. Uh, and for the, about the past nine months, I've been on the front end infrastructure team uh, working on performance. Uh, so I guess I'll give a brief history of Facebook. This will be brief, don't worry. So 2004, site launches. You know, it's a pretty fast site. Um, it had a lot of things going for it then, you know. It's Zuck, you know, he's got servers under his bed. He's got one box per, per school. You know, Harvard's on a fast network. MIT's on a fast network. There's really no latency. Site's blazing fast, right? Uh, so that's great. You know, site starts to grow. We get to 2006, you know, companies in Palo Alto now growing to multiple schools, high schools, work networks. And the site, you know, starts to, starts to feel some of that extra load. Um, Dustin Moskovitz was the head of engineering at the time. This was before I joined the company. He's rumored, to, he's rumored to have said, if any page takes more than 100 milliseconds to generate, it's way too long. We've got to be under 100 milliseconds. So they had a perf initiative then to get all pages back under 100, 100 milliseconds. Great. Cool. So now we move forward a little bit more. We're in 2008. We have another perf initiative <laughs> in January. But now we've slowed down a bit more. <laughs> uh, now it's one second. <laughs> Uh, if any page takes more than a second, it takes way too long, um, which is okay. That's, that's still pretty reasonable. Um, you know, it's a social site, so the more connections there are, the more data there is, you know. It kind of makes sense that there's more work to do as the site grows. Um, now, at the time we did this PERF initiative, um, about two-thirds of our time kind of that the user sees was spent on the server. So we had very little client-side time, uh, and most of our work is still being done on the server. So that's where we focused most of our efforts. You know, we worked hard for a few months. We got most of our pages back under one second. Our average was well under a second. Awesome. Jump forward another year. <laughs> we have another perf initiative. <laughs> and now our site is even slower, unfortunately. Um, as many of you know, uh, last year our site was fairly JavaScript heavy. Um, if you started searching Twitter for Facebook slow <laughs> JavaScript, you got a lot of results, probably from people like you commenting on how much JavaScript we had. Uh, it, kind of, it was kind of comical how much we had um, at one point. So I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Hip Hop, hip -hop for PHP. Uh, it's basically our project to compile PHP into uh, C++ code. Uh, it was a pretty good project. It saved us about 50% of our web tier CPU. Um, that project, all, in, all things included, is about 17 megs of JavaScript, or uh, of C++ code, uh, we have more JavaScript than that on our site, <laughs> uh, which the director of this project pointed out to me. <laughs> Why do you guys have so much JavaScript? What, do you, what crazy things are you doing that I can build a PHP compiler in less code, right? <laughs> it was pretty bad. <laughs> and then Steve Souders called us out numerous times <laughs> in his books <laughs> as examples of things not to do <laughs> with JavaScript. <laughs> So we were really feeling the pain. Uh, so in June of last year, our kind of worldwide 75th percentile load time for our pages was about five seconds, uh, which is pretty bad. Um, so to be fair to ourselves, um, <laughs> there are some pages included in that, like our Canvas page for platform, uh, which we can't always control what platform developers will do. Um, but we figured we should put all the weight on ourselves and include that in our metrics. Um, so that when we get faster, Canvas apps gets faster as well. So we decided, okay, five seconds. This is it's gotten out of hand, guys. We need to we need to do something about this. So Tom Okino and I, uh, one of my coworkers, we sat in a room one day and we're like, okay, what should our goal be for the end of the year? This is June 2009. What should our goal be? How fast do we think we can make the site? So we took one of our pages that loaded in about five seconds. We turned off JavaScript. And it loaded in about two and a half seconds. So we thought, OK, that's a pretty good goal. Let's aim for two and a half seconds. Uh, not the best way to pick goals uh, <laughs> in hindsight. But hey, we have a goal. Um, and it's, it's better than nothing. So how are we going to get there? Um, so this is a waterfall graph from about that time, the Green Day page on Facebook. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here, a lot of requests, a lot more requests. They have a lot of images and resources on their page. Um, 
But if you look here, highlighted in green are the CSS files, um, which is great, except for the fact that they're really far down on this graph. Um, you know, to render the page, the browser needs the CSS, and we're doing a bunch of stuff before then. So what are we doing before then? There's some images, but the main culprit here, JavaScript. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> There are a couple of problems here. Uh, one is that there are like 50 files, um, and two is the JavaScript is before the CSS, right? The browser doesn't necessarily need the JavaScript to show the user the page, but we are doing it first. Huge problem, commonly known problem, uh, and there's a common solution to this, which is just move your JavaScript to the bottom of the page. So I started Project Roadrunner. I'm a huge fan of code names. Uh, before this, I had Project Coyote, uh, the only thing faster than that. It's a Roadrunner, so great. <laughs> Perfect site speed code name. Uh, Project Roadrunner was to get all of our JavaScript, or most of it, uh, down to the bottom of the page. Great. Not a hard problem. We did it. And then we started, we launched that to employees internally, and everybody complained. Well, why? So the page would show, but in the background, we're downloading, you know, our meg of JS at that point, um, and the page isn't really actionable. If you click on something, it's going to break. Uh, and that kind of sucks, right? Especially if a user's on a really slow connection, really far away from our data centers. Um, they're gonna be waiting a lot of time where they see content on the page, but none of it's actionable. Um, so, so we couldn't just move all of our JS down uh, without coming up with something else, right? So, of course, I first went to work on a new code name, Primer. <laughs> we realized that we needed something that we could put at the top of the page that would hopefully get a lot of our themes done, so when the user clicks, uh, we at least have something there that can either maybe show them a loading indicator, or best case, actually you know, do what it's supposed to do. So Tom and I set out on this goal of, okay, how can we categorize everything we do on the site into as few buckets as possible, and maybe we'll be able to implement those interactions at the top of the page in very little code. So the goal was we could provide some sort of primer for the page, a base layer of JavaScript that would be loaded at the top before the user sees anything, that can power the interactions that the user is likely to do. So some things that we knew we had to have in there, things like our placeholder text, it's really annoying if you load a page, you click on an input and the placeholder text doesn't go away, right? So that needs to be there right away. But what are the other things on the site we do? We have a lot of interactions. So we started grouping these things, and we started trying to boil it down further and further, we decided there's basically one thing that goes on. Uh, basically, the user clicks on something, you send an AJAX request, and you shove some stuff into the DOM. That's it. That's basically all of what we do on the site. Um, and it's repeated over and over and over again. So we're like, okay, how can we build a JavaScript library or some amount of JavaScript that will enable this functionality um, without slowing down the page too much? Um, and as we thought about this, this was a really important thing, is that we really wanted to find an 80-20 solution. We realized there were things that did not fit the mold, um, but adding code to support those things oftentimes wasn't worth the trade-off. Um, we really wanted to try to get, to write as little code as possible that would handle as many of the cases as we could. So this is actually the first primer thing that I did. Uh, this is our language selection dialogue, right? It's pretty simple. It's, there's a link for this dialogue at the bottom of every page, right? It's just a link that says select your language. This dialogue pops up. You can select it and go on. So this had maybe 100 lines of JavaScript uh, associated with it when we started. Um, the basic way, this is the basic way we opened dialogues on the site before. You'd have an href, pound on an anchor. Uh, you'd have an ID, and you'd, you'd register some snippet of JavaScript to run when the page loads, they would find this link, add a click handler, and then that click handler would say, open this new dialogue with this content, right? Um, there are a couple of problems with that. One is you have to run code when the page loads. If you try to think about it, for especially for that language selector dialogue, how many times is the user actually going to change their language, right? Most users will do that once, ever, if ever. Um, but we were still running code on every page load for that dialogue, and that was a significant problem. So, and there are other problems with this, right? If the user right clicks on that select language link and says open a new window, they're not gonna get anything, right? They have to be running JavaScript for this to work. So, 
we decided to start, OK, how can we get better markup for this? OK, so let's just make it a link, a regular link that links to a web page. Uh, so here, let's link to ring.php. And we decided to use the rel attribute to say, OK, this is a link that should go to a dialog. Great. So <laughs> this is a step in the right direction. We have a real link. If right clicked on, it may do something reasonable. Um, and then we're like, OK, what JavaScript can go along with this? So this is some fairly simple JavaScript that we were able to put at the top of the page. Um, HTM here could be the document element or the body, um, whatever, what mind you. Um, so notice a couple things here. Um, we designed this to not, not have any dependencies, really. Um, so that's why we're doing all of our own event handling things here um, and not, not using any libraries. So if this is at the top of the page, we could put this in line and not have to worry about downloading any other JavaScript before this point, right? So this is fairly simple. You know, we're listening on the HTML element for all clicks. Um, nearest is a simple utility function you can find that walks up from the element that was clicked on, finds the nearest link. Um, and then we're looking for the rel attribute on the element. And bootloader is something that we have at Facebook that basically allows you to specify a resource. It will download that resource for you and then call your function, right? So in order to get, have fewer dependencies, we load we dynamically load the dialog class and then call dialog.bootstrap, which will take a URL and load a dialog from that endpoint. So now with just this little amount of code, we can now open that dialog for our language selector or for, let's say, if you're customizing your settings for feed. Right? It's fairly straightforward. And the awesome part about this is normally uh, you would specify in JavaScript to open a dialog by, by doing this code, right? So you'd like create a new dialog, set, set all the attributes on it. Uh, but again, this is kind of per use case, you are writing new JavaScript, right? And we thought, okay, how can we get around that? So you want to open this dialog, um, but you don't want to have to write any new JavaScript. Well, how about porting this JavaScript library of our, our dialog library to PHP? Why can't you, from an Ajax endpoint, specify all the same things you can from the JavaScript, and, or from the JavaScript itself. So we created an analogous class in PHP that would allow you to set all the same attributes for a JavaScript class. And what this is doing internally is when you create this dialog response class and set attributes on it, it will then, when you send the response back to the client, it will be rendered as more JavaScript back to this representation. So when that gets back to the JavaScript side, that code can be valid or what have you um, to open the dialog. So we move from having a lot of setup code in JavaScript ahead of time to basically making AJAX requests and setting up the JavaScript interaction from PHP and sending back a short snippet of JavaScript every time you request a new dialog to be opened or something like that. So this actually works pretty well. Um, so to open a dialog, you now only need this markup. You don't need to add any new code. Um, the centralized handler that's at the top of the page will find this, when this link is clicked on, it'll find the link, it will read out the href, and make an, send an Ajax request blindly to that endpoint. The endpoint can specify more instructions through the dialog response class that will then go back to the client to open the dialog. So this is pretty cool. Um, so this works well for opening dialogs. Um, it was a pretty simple conversion there. Then we thought, okay, what about general, what about general Ajax requests? Let's say I'm at the bottom of my feed. I want to have a link that says show more. I want to click that link and I want to see more stories, right? Well, this doesn't really fit that dialog model that well. Uh, so we added a new rel attribute, async. So, the only difference is, if you think about it, is what happens on the server, right? You still want to click that link and send an AJAX request. But instead here now, when I get to the server, I want the server to send, be able to send new instructions. So let's say I'd written in the old world, I'd kind of written my own JavaScript to do this. So I probably would attach a click listener to that element that says see more stories. Um, I would do an AJAX request, I'd get the response. And really what I'd do is I'd find a div and I'd shove the response into it, right? I'd use in our library uh, that we use at Facebook, that would just be dom.setContent, right? 
well, again, why can't that exist in PHP as well? Um, so we added new methods to our, async, our asynchronous response class that we use in PHP that allows you to do DOM operations from PHP endpoints. Uh, so basically, we have set content, append content, prepend content. Everything that's in our DOM library in JavaScript also exists in this PHP library. So you can specify a CSS selector is the first attribute, and the second attribute is just markup to be inserted. Um, and it turns out that, again, most of what we do on the site boils down to this. It's find a div on the page and shove some stuff into it. Um, it's really pretty simple. So of course now to support this new attribute, or the new rel attribute, uh, we add a section to our generic click handler, um, which is basically the same thing. Now we are bootloading or asynchronously loading um, our Ajax library um, in order to send this asynchronous request. Um, async async request.bootstrap, all that's doing is sending an Ajax request um, to a given endpoint. It's wrapping some other stuff as well. Um, so, so now we have this you know, 15, 20 lines. It's now able to actually do a lot of the stuff on our pages. You, know, you can click a show more link and have data and have markup be injected into the DOM for you. Uh, you can open dialogues. Um, that's a lot of the interactions on the site. But <laughs> this is a really odd name for something. But uh, so we ran into the case with these. Um, so if you imagine a show more link, right? So in order to be truly unobtrusive, um, you want that link to actually work. You want the user to be able to right click on that link and open in a new window, right? Or you want them to be able to turn off JavaScript and click that link and have something reasonable happen. So that makes sense that, okay, so I need my href attribute to be a legitimate link. But that's not oftentimes where you want your Ajax interaction to, to go to, right? Like, I want to click on that link, and when it sends an Ajax request, I want to go to Ajax slash ring.php. When the user right clicks, I just want to go to ring.php. So after much internal debate, myself and Tom, we were trying to figure out how we can do this. We were trying to use standards. Couldn't really think of anything good. So we decided to just add this Ajaxify attribute uh, to our links. So now uh, you can specify two URLs on an href, so, or sorry, on an anchor tag. Uh, so I can specify the href as ring.php, which is an actual page that the user can visit. Um, but if primer is at the top of this page, it will catch a click on this link. First look for the Ajaxify attribute, if it can find it, then that's where it will send its Ajax request to. Um, now, when we eventually switch our doc type to HTML5, I fully realize we can use a data attribute, but uh, Ajaxify will have to do for now. So this is great. Um, this powers a lot of the get requests that we do on the site. But what about for, these, uh, for all these other interactions we have? This is our composer that you see on your home page and your profile. Uh, this is kind of a sample post, um, and this widget is actually pretty complicated if you look at it. You can click view more comments, that will async in more comments. You can add a post without doing a page load. Uh, you can like it without doing a page load. There are lots of things in here, and then this is our kind of user suggester widget um, where you can do more things as well. Uh, so a lot of people were kind of skeptical. They're like, okay, Mac and Day, you've handled these cases, you've handled show more, you can open dialogues, but there's, there's no way this primer stuff could ever handle this stuff. This stuff is way too complicated. Uh, this thing is pretty complicated. This had many, many K of JavaScript associated with it alone, uh, as did this widget as well. So there's, this, this stuff is just too complicated. There's nothing you can do about it. But as I looked more closely at these, and again, the important thing here is just to boil everything down into very simple interactions. These are, these are not that different than, than anything else. The user's still gonna click on something, you're gonna send an Ajax request, and you're gonna shove some stuff into the DOM. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but these are a bit different, right, since these, are, these need to be post requests, and we don't really wanna use links for those. So I went on this quest, you know, I was looking around the web, researching different options, and I was like, what? Is there some sort of element that I could use for this? And I, I, was, I was on this HTML5 page, and I found this great new element that we can use for this stuff, it's crazy. They're forms, okay? These things, like, they store data. The user clicks on an input, 
and then like it sends that data to the server. Right? It's these are amazing. <laughs> these are exactly what we needed. <laughs> uh, so now, if you go back to this, these don't look like forms. Well, some of them do. <laughs> some parts of them do. Right? But this like link here, that's not a form. Like that X over there, that add us friend link, those aren't forms, right? This is just this is just old school markup. Right? There's no way you can make that a form. Well, I mean, you gotta, you gotta, again, you gotta go back to looking at what markup is available to you. <laughs> it turns out there's the button tag, which can be styled to look like anything. <laughs> so, really, we really tried to push the boundaries here. Um, so, I'll, I'll dive into exactly how we uh, built some of these in a second. Um, but, okay, so if we're gonna use this form, forms normally are submitted, you know. They're blocking, they're synchronous requests, and, and that's not slick, right? We want this to be Ajaxed in, we want everything to be fancy, right? Um, so how about we have a centralized listener that just turns these forms into Ajax requests, right? It's actually pretty simple. So again, the Ajaxify attribute rears its ugly head again. <laughs> uh, so this is how we mark forms as, hey, this form can be turned into an Ajax request, right? So all you have to do is add Ajaxify equals one. When this form is submitted, this is a new addition to Primer, uh, listening on the HTML tag for the on submit event. When it finds it, it will see if the form has the Ajaxify attribute. If so, it will load our form library, dom-form, and that will enable it to serialize the form and send it as an Ajax request. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, all the data you need, you can either store in the action attribute for the form or as hidden inputs. It works surprisingly well. <laughs> Uh, so, so let's take this, this example. This is our uh, UFI, it's Unibac Unified Feedback Interface. Uh, so this blue box that you see all over the site that's on many of our pages, right? So we started going to town on this thing. This, this thing had tons and tons of JavaScript, right? So okay, we started pretty simply. This is pretty obviously a form. Uh, this thing opens a dialog, like a confirmation dialog, so okay. We can make that a rel equals dialog link. Now we have here a rel equals async link to view more comments. Um, this comment link it used to be a lot of JavaScript to like focus this and change of classes, yada, yada, yada. It turns out the label tag does that. Uh, <laughs> so we just use that, styling it to look like a link. And this is a button tag styled to look like a link. Like, so this is one huge form, this entire, this entire widget. And the great thing is, it works without JavaScript now, uh, because it's all just legit stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, so what did this enable us to do? So to give you a really concrete example, this is a video our director of engineering, or VP of engineering, rather, uh, Shrep made. For that little feedback interface, we were able to delete all this JavaScript. <laughs> And we celebrated these diffs. <laughs> these diffs started flying around all the time. People were applying primer and just deleting entire files, <laughs> deleting entire libraries that they had built. <laughs> um, and this was awesome for us, right? Because all this JavaScript was at the top of the page. Yes, this goes and goes and goes. And this isn't much commented code. This is just code, <laughs> code that we're able to get rid of. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. <laughs> so primer in effect ended up being JavaScript that let us delete JavaScript. It's awesome. <laughs> so how did we find all of these places where we, where we could apply it? Um, well, so we were able to write some CSS that was able to detect where we were doing bad JavaScript before, where places where the href was equal, equal to pound and there was no clear way that it would work without JavaScript. We started highlighting those things with CSS and turning this on internally in the company. So it meant that any time an engineer saw a link highlighted in pink, they needed to fix something, right? So this allowed us to scale this process across the entire engineering team to fix all of these problems. So this is back to the waterfall we saw before, right? So this is what it was, and this is, you know, horrible as we all know, JavaScript at the top, CSS at the bottom. But now with Primer, at the top of the page, we didn't need much JavaScript otherwise on the page, right? The JavaScript can come in later. Primer will load all the JavaScript it needs when the user does something. So this is our waterfall after. <laughs> uh, we got a couple of CSS files, Primer comes in, and then we're on with the rest of the page. 
Now, if you go back, you see this green line is where the page is actually being rendered. That moves up quite a bit <laughs> when, we, uh, when we're able to, to put our JS at the bottom. Awesome. <laughs> this means the user seen content seconds before they were, before they could before. Like, it was pretty cool. So, this is actually an excerpt from, <laughs> from the comment at the top of primer.js. Um, I want to stress this. This is really important. So, primer is meant to be a very small file, right? We don't want a lot of code at the top of the page blocking things. Um, and if you're not careful, people will add things to everything you do. <laughs> engineers will mess it up. At Facebook, we have 300 engineers. Everybody has their super special use case that's gotta be in there, okay? And this goes for everybody. This goes for Tom, this goes for me. <laughs> Tom had to say no to me several times as I wanted to add things in there. Um, so it's really important to like stop people, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like you can't win this by just adding stuff. You have to be really strict with yourself and everyone involved. Um, and that's the only way we're able to keep this, uh, keep primer really small. Um, there are lots of things that we've wanted to add that we've just had to say no to. Um, primer is strictly the things that have to work when the user sees the page. Uh, for instance, stopping a form, like a form that has placeholder text that the user didn't enter any input for, if they click submit, it's okay to go to the result page for the first half second before the JavaScript loads. Um, it's nice if JavaScript is able to stop that form, but it's not mandatory. The user won't be that upset if they have to go there, right? So it's important to, to have this separation of things that must work and things that are nice to work. Because if you allow things in that are nice to work, you'll be back where we were before. You'll have a mega JavaScript at the top of your page. <laughs> so, so we did all this work, great, we're deleting files, we're continuing to delete files, but we're actually starting to work on some new things kind of built on top of Primer, or now that we have Primer. So the first thing is logging. Uh, so we keep, we have a lot of abstractions at Facebook. Uh, Tom and I joke about it a lot. Um, we're always, you know, trying to find ways to get stuff to the user faster. Um, oftentimes, the person who pays the price for this is our data team. Um, they, are ad they are always trying to know what the user is doing, right? And they're trying to log it. Um, so when you have things like an AJAX interaction that is completely powered by JavaScript, it's very hard for the data team to generally track that. Um, but the nice thing about primer links is that it's so obvious what's going on. The user clicked on a link, we, have, we know which URLs they're gonna hit, and it goes. So we've been able to build a new logging framework. Um, it's actually built by a couple of the other guys on the infrastructure team. It allows us to very easily log everything that the user is doing in the browser by building something that looks very much like Primer. It's a link at the top of the page, it's a snippet of JavaScript at the top of the page that's listening for all of the user's clicks, and it's able to independently look at a link that was clicked on and know what's going to happen, because Primer is so simple, right? It only has to look at the Ajaxify attribute or the href attribute. It's pretty simple. Um, what are other things that we can do? This is Zuck's page, right? We're on his info tab. You may have noticed, uh, this is a feature of our site. It's one of our many great abstractions. Um, when you click over to his wall tab, note the URL now has this, this uh, hash in it, right? Um, so that's a system we call page transitions and or quickling. Um, so basically, we've Ajaxified our site. We almost look like uh, one of these fancy sites that was built from the ground up to, be, to not have page loads, almost. <laughs> um, so when you do a lot of when you go from page to page on Facebook, oftentimes you won't actually have to do a full page load. We will send an Ajax request, load in the new content, and update the URL. Now, you probably guessed, this system involves lots of JavaScript. Um, it'd be awesome if we could get rid of this JavaScript. The nice thing is, this is really just a primer, right? The user clicked on this wall link, they did an Ajax request, and we've shoved some data into the DOM, right? Um, and we updated the URL. But there's no reason we can't add that update URL method to our PHP libraries. So from any Ajax endpoint, you'd be able to update the URL. Um, so we're actually really looking for more and more ways to kind of roll this out. Um, yeah, and the big, the big gist there is send stuff to the server and have the server send back some small subset of, intera of new interactions to fulfill. 
So the goal, 2.5 seconds. Did we hit it? Yes. Did we have a comfortable margin? No. <laughs> we hit our goal, I think it was December 23rd of last year, just before Christmas break. Um, so, but we made it, and that's the good thing. Uh, so now we've set even more aggressive goals. Um, we're launching new abstractions to get there. We're also continuing to roll out Prima. There's so much, we have so much JavaScript to delete. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> so yeah, with that, uh, I'll open it up if there are any questions. Yeah. So on your waterfall, it looked at the top like you're opening a lot of HTTP connections because there's a bunch of DNS lookups and um, uh, TCP slow start. Have you guys thought about trying to control how many separate hosts you have, like with the Facebook CDN and that? Right. So I think that stuff is pretty well optimized. So I think we follow, I think Yahoo had a blog post about it, uh, where we have, we have two domains. We have a.static.act.facebook.com and b.static.act. So each one is doing uh, two requests. Um, it's a bit tough to see in the waterfall, but we also, it's a bit different for our images. Um, but our, Java, our JavaScript and CSS is served from two domains, um, generally. But yeah, there's still probably more, more work and experimentation to, to do there. Yeah. Um, with all the Ajaxify links, it seems like they're all just the same URL with slash Ajax. Uh, is that always the case? Or if, if that's the case, have you guys looked into at all, kind of, instead of having a separate cap for the Ajax request, handling more on the server side, saying, okay, this request came from next to the next to request, or it was requested with you know, a content type request of maybe accepting JSON with the HTML stuff with the JSON, like that, rather than having to separate this and having the extra Right, so that, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, for Ajax requests, for GET requests, they're oftentimes quite different. Um, it's not clear that they will be kind of just slash Ajax. One good example is at the bottom of the page, we used to have that bar going all the way across the bottom, that chat bar. On the left-hand side, there's this app doc. Um, it's kind of like a start menu uh, for Facebook. Uh, that Ajax endpoint was very different than the page it went to. And those you know, are made by separate teams and things like that. Um, but where we do do that is for uh, form submissions. Uh, for form submissions, you never specify a different URL, um, but that form endpoint uh, will try to figure out, okay, is this an actual XML HTTP request? If so, send back a you know, JSON response. Otherwise, just redirect somewhere. Yeah. So you moved more of the client stuff. You've got more going on on the server now. Yes. Right. So you improve the speed of your server, the, the server side. Now the front end was slow. You improve this front end by pushing more back into the server. So how does that balance out on the server side? Right. It's a good question. So oftentimes, uh, what we were doing on the server, uh, or sorry, oftentimes the way it worked is we had some JavaScript that we'd written. It'd make the Ajax request, get a bunch of markup, um, and then get that back and find where to put it in the DOM and do different operations, make different decisions. Uh, so oftentimes, on the server, we already were generating the markup. Uh, so this change ended up being a lot of it was just instead of s adding this as just raw data to our asynchronous response, uh, we just made it more explicit what was going to happen to it, saying, find this div and put this in here. Uh, so the server load uh, is roughly the same. There's very little additional server load. Uh, fairly deleting all that uh, JavaScript is a great thing, you said, but that wasn't your original objective to actually delete all that. Um, it was to make the page load faster. And in your analysis of metrics of, of that, um, that's, was that like the original page load and you didn't care about caching later on or any um, advantages of that? You were just trying to get that the first one down? Right, uh, so in the waterfall, uh, that was, I believe, an empty cache um, result. So we do, we clearly do care a lot about caching. Um, and it, it plays out differently on different pages on our site. Uh, for instance, the home page, when you go there, you're usually hitting cache for most of your resources. When you start going out into the fringe and different you know, pages that might have different widgets that you don't see as often, uh, those, those widgets will certainly have their own JavaScript. Um, that is usually not cached. Um, so while it wasn't the original goal to be able to delete the JavaScript, um, the goal was to be able to move our JavaScript to the bottom 
Uh, but once you do that, we, we still, um, there's, there are great tools for, for tracing this. Uh, one I think is Dynatrace. Um, if you look at that tool, even when we moved our JavaScript to the bottom, you'd still see the browser spin up once it hit the JavaScript, right? So it's still kind of fail if the user's on a slow connection and they see the page and then their browser like spins out for five seconds. Um, so that's the kind of secondary goal of deleting this JavaScript and actually cleaning it all up. Yeah. Yeah, so um, slightly back from one of the other questions where you're, so it sounds like now you're doing more of your templating on the server and sending markup combined with data over the wire in response to Ajax requests. Am I correct in that? Uh, it's usually, so when you're using primer, you're usually not sending any data. You're sending just markup. Okay, so you're gonna send like a markup template <coughs> over the wire and then combine it with like say the comment form for instance. Yep. So somebody makes a comment and then you wanna actually show that comment immediately without a page refresh. Right. You need some markup to wrap around the text they just typed in. Where does that templating happen now? Is that happening on the server or is it happening it's happening on the server, um, which is actually nice because when you rendered the page, that's where the template had to exist. Um, so we're doing that templating still on the server. Um, and that's actually a good example. So let's say you, you type in, you know, migrate comment, you hit submit, uh, you send the request, and what's actually gonna happen is the server will, you know, render that new comment and send back that comment plus a new input box. Because your old input box has stuff in it, right? And it would require JavaScript to clear it out. Just Get rid of it. <laughs> so the, the follow-up is basically, yeah. um, is that a, a bad trade-off in that now you're sending a lot more stuff over the wire than say just the JSON that you could still do some templating on the links? Right, it is a trade-off and we end up, right, we're sending more data over the wire and we're also sending, um, we're also sending you know, small bits of JS as well. Um, it's actually not, it turns out to be not too bad because if you want to centralize all of your rendering into one place, uh, like we've done, we've always tried to you know, kind of get most of our actual HTML rendering in PHP, um, we were still sending most of that markup anyway. Um, so the additional size for HTTP, or for Ajax responses, is actually only marginally larger. Um, and even if it were slightly larger, we're much more comfortable paying the cost for that when the user is actually trying to do something. Um, we want to avoid paying the cost when the users might not do that thing. Um, so it's okay, we're okay adding you know, a few milliseconds to a write request when 99% of the person's interaction with the page will be a read. Have you guys considered having like a server-side DOM renderings that you would only have one code of your rendering, but it could be on client server server side? Right, uh, yeah, we've actually, uh, We've messed around with that stuff a little bit. Um, our inbox product works a lot like that um, on a templating system that we tried to build that would be able to be rendered in PHP or JavaScript. Um, and that kind of boils down to, uh, there, are, there are lots of issues at play there, um, but one of those, one fundamental discussion there is kind of, are we this Ajax site that you will never do a page load on? or are we the sum of many small page loads? Um, and I'm trying to push us back in the direction of many fast, small page loads. Where do you guys uh, delineate between like a single page app versus when you go to a URL? Uh, in our current system. Um, so we will take any URL that you click on, just about, and make it an Ajax interaction automatically. <laughs> uh, but I think we're out of time. Uh, so if you have any more questions, uh, totally grab myself or Tom Okino. Um, afterward or shoot me an email. Also, Facebook is hiring. We still have a lot of JavaScript to write and delete, uh, so we're looking for both sides. <laughs> Thanks.